Um, so welcome. This is um, uh, the uh, speaker series for Friends of Gold Butte. Um, tonight we have Johnny Rossi, who's um, the um, board president for the local ham club, has been involved with ham radio for a very long time. Yeah. And we invited him to come in and talk to you tonight about uh, introduce ham radio. And there's for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, it's you're very useful for emergency communication. And with many of us spending lots of time, you know, in a really remote, restricted area, um, that was what the primary reason that got me started on ham radio was I wanted to have something out there that that would give me a chance of, of communicating out there. So anyhow, so John's, Johnny's going to get you an introduction to the the whole. It's a broad, broad area of of uh, interests in, and activities. And so he's gonna give you an introduction to the stuff and then we'll um, later have time for some questions. And we, I think we're gonna do a little um, tour here too. There's some facilities that the Ham Radio Club has set up here at the Steam Center um, where we are tonight. Um, and so we'll first do some slides and then we'll do a quick little tour. Hopefully we can make that work. So Johnny. Okay, okay. welcome everybody. I uh, hope you enjoy this. Right now we're gonna I'll show you this slideshow. Can is it, hopefully everybody can see it. Yes. So uh, first slide. What is amateur radio? Amateur radio, also known as ham radio, is a popular service and hobby that enables so many activities, from public service to scientific experimentation to sheer fun. And you guys can read along with this as well as me talking about it. But uh, there are over 740,000 practicing in the United States and 1.75 million worldwide. Uh, there are federally licensed uh, amateur radio operators everywhere in your neighborhood, in your workplace, and in your schools. And the reason we are licensed is because we have very strict uh, enforcement of the type of language we use, uh, how we talk on the radio. We uh, consider ourselves, you know, uh, semi-professional broad, well, not broadcast, but semi-professional operators, uh, not like you would find uh, with CB radio, no offense. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's why we're licensed. And, and if we have any committed any violations against the FCC, we can be fined thousands of dollars, have our license ex suspended or, or completely revoked. Wherever you go, people just like you use ham radios to communicate without relying on the Internet or a cell phone network. And it can go wherever you go. You can hike a trail, climb a mountain, or paddle a river and take your radio with you. And we can also send and receive emails uh, without the use of internet by using our ham radios. And uh, we've done that. Uh, we practice that uh, on a number of occasions here. And actually, this is a picture of Mitch uh, up on Little on Virgin Peak, but. I think is that no, you, Mitch? That's, a, that's that other dude. Oh, that's that other. That's his brother. Uh, ham radio, radio uh, even reaches as far as outer space. Ham radio operators can talk to astronauts aboard the International Space Station, talk to other operators through satellites uh, orbiting Earth, and even bounce their radio signals off the moon and back. And a couple of our operators here have uh, done that. Have you talked to the space station? Yeah, one of our operators has actually talked to the space station and uh, bounced signals through uh, uh, off of satellites as well to talk to other stations in and around the country. The amateur radio service is a valued element of neighborhoods and municipalities across the U.S. In times of disaster, when regular, radi regular communications channels fail, the amateur radio service works with public service agency. Here in Mesquite, we, are, we provide secondary communications to both the Southern Utah and Southern Nevada Hospital Coalition. The Southern Utah Hospital Coalition consists of six uh, hospitals in Southern Utah, and then there are 16 hospitals in the Southern Nevada Hospital Coalition. Uh, we have radios uh, installed uh, at Mesa View Hospital here in Mesquite, and we regularly uh, do drills with the Southern Utah Hospital Coalitions and at times with uh, Southern Nevada. And uh, we also are involved with our CERT team members here in Mesquite. Uh, we are a, a division of the fire department and we provide uh, training and exercises uh, with uh, the, our CERT members uh, when we do things like, uh, can you feel it, Nevada, uh, during the shakeout in Nevada? 
or the Utah Shakeout. We provide support for the Utah Shakeout in Southern Utah as well. <clears throat> Community, community events such as FEMA, the American Red Cross, and the Salvation Army to assist communications efforts. Amateurs can use their radios to volunteer within their communities, providing communications for events like county fairs, parades, and road races. Here in Mesquite, we support two 100-mile runs in the desert, one in the Arizona desert in February, and a couple of weeks later, we do the same 100-mile, uh, 48-hour period up on Flat Top Mesa, plus other events as well. We have uh, helped with a uh, uh, parades here in Mesquite. So it's kind of a fun hobby to get to know your neighbors and everything else. And whenever they see us, you know, they're, they're glad that we're around. To get licensed, although people get involved with amateur radio for many reasons, they all pass a test to earn the Federal Communications Commission's license that shows they have basic knowledge of the principles of electricity, radio technology, and operating rules. We also teach a basic technician class to get you licensed here at the our STEAM Center here in Mesquite. And we've taught uh, general licenses, which is the next level up as well. Mitch attended one of those classes and is now a general licensed operator. Education. This knowledge has practical everyday applications that educators have used to teach science, technology, engineering and math concepts. Lots of hams got into the hobby as kids and followed their interest in radio to exciting careers as astronauts, engineers, pilots, and more. And here at the STEAM Center, you know, if we can promote more younger kids to get involved with this, you know, that's a way forward for them to get into those disciplines. The ham radio frequencies begin below the AM broadcast band and extend into extremely high microwave frequencies. Ham radio operators use the, these frequencies to communicate with each other. And here you can see in a, a portable setup, this gentleman, he's got a solar panel charging a battery, and he's got his uh, radio connected to an antenna somewhere that we cannot see and is communicating that way and keeping his equipment uh, fully operational by charging with a solar panel. Using microphones, Morse code, and even interfacing a radio with a computer or tablet to send data, text, or images. Some complete in contests trying to make the most radio context, contacts within a certain time frame. Uh, on June, June 22nd and 23rd this year, we have our annual field day event here in Mesquite. We'll be set up at the Welcome Center. So if anybody would like to come and visit us, you can get on the air with a licensed operator. You can talk to other hams across the United States, Canada, Mexico, or whatever foreign country uh, could come in as well if the propagation is good for that day. And so uh, that's another uh, event that we practice for. The reason we do that, we put ourselves out in uh, situations other than our home environment to set up our uh, radios, our uh, power supplies, our batteries, our antennas, coax, and everything else so that we can communicate effectively with uh, other hams throughout the United States. And there are different categories, of course, that we can get into, but uh, we have placed first in, in one of our categories here in Mesquite, which is such a small little town. It was uh, quite an honor for us to obtain that uh, recognition. Amateur radio has been around for over 100 years, and the technology behind it continues to evolve and advance today. As you can see in this picture, there's this great big uh, Yagi antenna. It's like an oversized TV antenna that we had back in the 50s and 60s and early 70s before cable. We don't need all that. It's nice to have that, you know, if you uh, are remote and stuff. But here in Mesquite, uh, we, a lot of us are in the uh, HOAs. Sun City, uh, we're authorized to have two antennas outside, which is great. Other communities, not so much, but uh, we know how to make them stealthy and we still know how to get out and communicate with other hams throughout the United States and the rest of the world. Operators always finding new ways to explore amateur radio. Experimenting with digital applications of this technology through things like coding, mobile apps, and drones. A number of us have apps on our telephone that we can use to get into repeaters throughout the United States and throughout any parts of the world that we are licensed to operate in. And so it's, you don't always need a radio, you just need a, 
a good cell phone and we can uh, still get in and communicate with others around the world. So your first step is getting on the air. The ARRL Amateur Radio Relay League Ham Radio License Manual will, give you, will guide you as you get started in the hobby. As you select your equipment, set up your first station and make your first contact. They're easy to understand. They include the latest question pool. This slide's outdated, but we now are, that is actually good, I believe, until 2026 now. And we have the latest manuals here at the STEAM Center that we give out to students so that they can uh, get their technician class license. To learn more about this endless possibilities of amateur radio, where the technology is headed and how to get involved, visit the ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, at www.awrl.org or come to one of our Mesquite meetings. It's the second Monday of the month, uh, every month uh, except July and August. We have a meeting at Fire Station 3 at 6 p.m. at that time. But then if, if you want, you can get a hold of Mitch, um, you can get a hold of Brenda, and they have uh, all of our contact information. You can get a hold of us that way too if you're interested in getting a license and taking a class. So I'm going to start with maybe talking about what is a repeater so people understand. So, so basically a repeater is a device that you transmit into and let's say with with five watts of power on your radio and then you picks it up by the repeater and it rebroadcasts your transmission maybe at 50 watts output. So if it's on a mountaintop, you go in with five watts, it comes out with 50 watts. So then you have a very, very broad coverage range. So if you're on a mountaintop, uh, think of it as going from here to, to uh, one of the mountaintops in Utah, that gets rebroadcast throughout the whole St. George area, up to Hurricane, Torquerville, and beyond. Uh, plus, it, you know, everything down here, it just sort of repeats back. It just repeats in a circular pattern all over the place. So uh, it's a great way to uh, get your little voice out to many, many people. Okay, so back up on the screen, we have the uh, Intermountain Intertie Connectivity Map. So what this is, it's a series of number of repeaters throughout. Well, this one here shows just the Utah portion. But uh, from here, Utah Hill, which is close to us outside of St. George along Highway 91 that most of you are probably familiar with, we can transmit into here and we can go down into Las Vegas where, where there's another repeater down there. And from there, we can also go into Jacobs Lake or Navajo Mountain over here by Page. And then from there, it can go down all the way into Scottsdale. And there's a map later on that'll show all of that information. Then from, so from here, we can actually go north up through my lad pass, clear up into West Yellowstone, Montana, or over to Boise, Idaho, or through Twin Falls, uh, Idaho Falls, hitting all of the major cities along that uh, southerly route, and then north uh, of Boise quite a ways. So it's, it's a great system that uh, we, a lot of us take advantage of, for those of us that you know, come from up north, you know, the travel along the I-15 corridor, uh, we have that capability of talking all the way up and down it. I think uh, one thing that's important, so then even just with a, a lightweight handheld unit here in town, we can reach Utah Hill, yeah, Jelly's got one here, and so, from that, it actually, once it goes into that it chain, is rebroadcast on all of those repeaters simultaneously. So then when you're talking here on your handheld and it goes out to Utah Hill, it's heard all the way clear into um, Idaho, Wyoming, <laughs> Montana, all the way up and down that whole corridor in Utah. Everywhere that's on that network is broadcast through there. So then you can talk to someone in Bear Lake, Idaho, you know, from your handheld here. So if you needed help. You know, yeah. There's a lot of people listening. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah, now you gotta be, be aware that that you know it, it is going out all right. across. Well, that's everywhere. a good thing. Yeah, yeah. might not be talking, but if you say Mayday, I need help. Yeah. You get into that system, there'll be thousands of people that are gonna hear that and say, What do you need? Yeah. So this is gonna be a dumb question. Can you talk to just one person? Yeah. Yes, you can talk to one person. So you normally a thousand people will hear your conversation. No, no. <laughs> that's what I meant. Without a thousand people hearing? Nope. 
Oh, no, God. it's it's out to the world. <laughs> it's and you do have to re remember that. I mean, that's part of. No, I get it. Like on the CB. A CB. Sorry. So even a CB, you're not talking to one person. You're, no, talking, you're talking to anybody to that's around. Yeah. The the only way to get around that is with uh, you know some digital methods that you you change what you might call a PL tone or something like that, so that you're more on a, your own private conversation. It is possible to restrict who hears it, but it's kind of technical. Most people don't bother with it. I don't yeah. care if somebody hears you. Yeah. So in all of these repeaters, they all have their frequencies that are they're set to, uh, their sub-audible tones, and everything you need to do to program in, in the, uh, your mobile radio or handheld radio, whatever you want. And so on, so there is a repeater, though, that, that one of the things that now, you know, when you, if you're in Gold View, virtually anywhere in Gold View, you can hit that. That Logandale Moatha repeater. I can't. I that one I haven't been able to hit. I was able to get through some of the stuff to some of the Vegas repeaters. Right. And so I also was able to from the town site get through to. Um, and I didn't get. I was trying to get on our net for the town site. I had the wrong. I got a Vegas repeater, but I got the wrong one. I got into a, a net that actually was in this inter the, this intercept. So I was listening to people in Idaho talking on that their weekly net. There's another whole network system that goes into California out of Vegas too. Yeah, that's called the Carlos system. There are I think 29 repeaters in the Carlos system, all the way from near close to uh, north of San Diego, all the way up to Mount Shasta, uh, over to Lake Tahoe. Hawthorne, Nevada, you can hear it in Hawthorne, uh, all along that uh, western edge of uh, Nevada, eastern side of California. So, so from Gold Butte, from the standpoint, you know, you're out in the monument. That's the thing that's most interesting. Yeah, if you're out in the monument and you carry one of these little radios in there, you can even make them smaller than that. You can program that repeater in yes. Overton, and yes. most places out there. You may not be able to get that little radio to talk directly to the search and rescue guys, but you can hit that repeater and talk to somebody in Overton and say, I need search and rescue. I got a flat tire. We're stranded up here, no water. And you'll be able to get that help. And so Where a cell phone would not do that. Yeah. No cell phone. Now, the, the one thing with that repeater is not hooked into a, so the, these chains of repeaters that we're talking about, they're different ones that are hooked into the, that one particular one that you reach gold butte is sort of a standalone repeater it's not hooked into any other chain but then it's strong enough though that it's it you can monitor it in mesquite so i'm yeah. going to add it into my monitor um, right. uh, frequencies because then i know you know if anybody in gold butte could hit it and then i can actually hear so i can talk from my house to someone anywhere in gold butte so, so if you set up a you know i'm in trouble message yeah. in gold butte and get the overton repeater everybody in with radios in Logandale, Overton, Moapa, most of Mesquite, and down also down into Las Vegas, would be receiving your signal. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't have trouble finding somebody to answer. Yeah. It's a, a you know it's an article of faith in the ham radio community that if you say Mayday, don't say it lightly. But if you put a Mayday call out there, it's taken seriously. Yeah. That was the people next question. Yeah. Was. Well, see, okay. yeah, and every time that we've gone out, I've been out there with you, I've had a radio. And, and you, you just know, don't tell us these things. Well, I, I'm waiting for somebody to let you know. Because I'm ready. To the rescue, I'll put my cape on. Now, but now that you, you know the helicopter, right? so now that you know that you can hit the Moapa repeater yeah. out there, so you want to make sure you have that program. So, is there a way to know where you are to tell someone where you are, or can they triangulate that? Or no, you have to know where you are. You pretty much have to know a good general area where you're at if you're out in the monument. Right, but there's a lot of people that go out there that are not. Right, a lot of people carry a GPS unit, but some some of our radios, uh, in, our mobile radios and our handhelds, but uh, we have handheld radios that have a GPS capability okay. as well. And uh, so we know exactly where we're at. You can also use the What Three Words app to find out where you're at. Yeah, and yeah. you can, yeah. you know, uh, at well, least yes. find out what your Latin long is, you know, if you need to, or use the what three words, because you can, you know, give somebody you hear on the radio with the what three words or give them your Latin long using the what three words app. Okay. 
Now, the, the, the tough one out in Gold Butte is that there's virtually no, very few places that you have a cell phone. That, that was why I got interested in ham radio, because there's virtually no cell phone access. There's, there's you know, very little anything. And so ham radio is really, you know, other than satellite, uh, yeah, is a really, it's really, really helpful. very helpful. Now, uh, the cell phone, even if you're not going to have internet access, those maps on your cell phone will still, if you preloaded your map, I mean, which most of a lot of our people that go out there do that, with a Benzo then you can like write. That, you know, kind of, then mean, you can go you know, pretty Kind of where you're at, yeah. 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 A lot of people, we, we do monitor here in Mesquite. Yeah. I typically monitor during the day and stuff like that, or if I'm driving in my truck, I turn on my radio. Now, right. one thing for the pamphlet here we may want to talk about, though, is is starting to regularly monitor the, the Moapa repeater because you know that, that's really about place you can hit reliably out in the old dude. Well, you can hit Utah Hill. Well, it depends. Hill. I tried it and I um, could be just where I was sitting. So well, I you use a handheld or what? I know I was using the one of my just the, the distance over to the Moapa is really since it's just right straight across the bottom right. there. It's, and and, and the it's big, sitting up high too. So. The big thing is, you know, these, these little antennas, you know. They're basically a, a, a radiator, but they, they work, you know, to a point. But you can get a quarter wave antenna, or you can get a, a full size one that's, you know, like three feet long. It's uh, that really gets out there. So they expand your distance. Yeah, it really yeah. expands your distance and your communication ability. So we always say buy a cheap radio, and but buy always always buy a good antenna. And, that, and that's the was you know, the, the sort of the emergency communication point. That's the guys that. I didn't realize there was a repeater over there until more recently that I could reach. So as an entry level um, radio, like if you wanted a little handheld one, what, what could you expect to spend? $40. Really? Yeah. Good. For a good one. For, I mean, I, this is like an eight watt radio with a, you know, a, a quarter wave uh, antenna charger. And if you want all the, the stuff that you have, more than that. You don't want to know what that is. Yeah, I was going to say your wife doesn't know. Yeah, yeah. So this is just another map, and this shows what's called the Sinbad region. It starts up here in near Vernal, Utah, and goes all the way down, and it gets through a lot of the eastern part of the state, so that they, they have a, a link from American Fork, Utah, that goes in here. Bruno and Peak, and then it gets transmitted all around. So, uh, if you're at any one of these locations, you know, in around Green River, Wyoming, or Moab, into Canyonlands National Park, Capitol Reef, and Monticello, Utah, you can talk from you can talk from Monticello into Provo through here, Monticello, all the way up to Vernal. And so, uh, for the eastern part of Utah, it uh, provides them with some great service. And these repeater networks exist throughout the U.S. And so you do have to kind of know how to program you know, your radio into finding a you know, particular repeater where you're at. But just about anywhere you're in the U.S., you're probably covered by some repeater somewhere. The repeaters are, are these aren't, it isn't a government program. These are all run basically by, um, you know, volunteer, you know, groups that do this stuff. They get, you know, various funding sources to help out with it and stuff. And they're big networks, some of them, as you can see. Uh, but uh, but they're just you know the ham operators and, and groups that are that, that manage at least and they get good coordination with you know, emergency services all, all around so a lot of the big antennas you see there will be an additional ham you know, repeater antenna on, on part of the, a lot of the, the big mountain and antenna arrays that you see that have microwave and TVs and stuff and there's probably and there in the points you get points in there on the difficulty terrain getting up there and, and we as chasers on the back end we get the point of making communications with them and so in a utc time so right now it is uh, 0140 utc and it is uh 640 uh here in mesquite so there's a seven hour difference so we can you know like click, click on these guys and see where they're at and uh, there's a, a lot of European stations, a lot of Japan stations from all, you know, Europe and the Middle East and um, uh, Japan area, Australia, that get on here. And we can try to make communications with them through single sideband or Morse code or uh, other means as well, or data modes as well. Yeah. So in, in Gold Butte, surprisingly, there are 28 certified peaks for soda. 
only three of them have ever been activated now. That tells you they're hard to get to. Yeah, they're, they're remote. They're, there's no easy, yeah. And so, so Johnny's the, the one activator of, uh, the first activator of Little Virgin Peak. And then another one of our club members, Rick, activated um, Virgin Ridge Peak. And then also Mount Banks, which is not in Goldview. Activated, then, it just means you got up to the and top then of course, and talked. And then I just activated. Somebody heard you. Yeah. And then I activated just a few weeks ago on Goldview Peak. Bob over there was up on the top of that with me when we did that. And I was able to get four four contacts, which is enough to make it a legit. Just, just a niche in the hobby. Yeah. You know, so what do we do with all this cool radio stuff? Yeah. Hey, let's go hike up on that mountain and see what we can talk to. And see if we can do that. So it's a, but it's an interesting sort of piece, yeah. piece out there. So anyhow, so there's still 25 peaks in Gold Butte that nobody's ever activated. So. How many can you drive up to? Those are the ones I want. Yeah. <laughs> so this what I what, what I've got on the screen right now is it's fact, there's not very many of you can even drive to the base of that. <laughs> so this right now is a, a, a way for us to check in uh, to different nets and everything else, or provide uh, certain forms uh, if we if we need to get and uh, communicate with a, a certain agency. So we can go in here and we can load up. We'll take a like a general form. No, we don't want to general. Let's just do a, a oh, we could get like a, a FEMA form, for example. And uh, so we could bring up some kind of an incident briefing or a general message, an activity log. Uh, here's one here that's for hospitals that would be of interest, you know, especially during a a big emergency where we can get in, fill this up. Yeah, so we can fill out all of this, this information and everything else, tell them the status of the hospital, do they have power, do they have lighting, do they have water, sewer, toilets, all of these things. We can put in comments. Uh, we can determine how many medical staff, do they have any damage to their building? We can, we can list everything about the hospital here or some other facility, medical facility. And then we can send that off to one of our served agencies and they'll get this report, you know. So typically we, we would send it from here. We would send it into Las Vegas. We could send it into St. George. We could send it into Salt Lake Health Department, you know, if it concerns Southern Utah. So uh, we and we we practice this stuff. We, you know, we send these forms and everything else back and forth. So something this is one way that we can you know help serve the community and uh, People around us and stuff. So I think the big takeaway is that part of becoming a hand, licensed hand operator is you sort of agree to function as an emergency communication system in the U.S. So should things go really wrong, um, you know, ham radio operators are sort of the backup communication system. Yeah. So and they practice that and get organized to do that. Right. So Cal Fire has an extensive network of ham radio operators that are always standing by mm -hmm. to revert provide the emergency communications for them. You get uh, down south or in the Midwest where they have tornadoes and stuff or big floods, you know, ham radio operators are kind of like the first on the scene to provide any kind of emergency communication, let people know where things are. Uh, uh, and they can pass messages, you know, for people you know, like the survivors and stuff like that. And they can let their family members, you know, know in some other town, you know, who's here, who's well, and that kind of information. I was uh, up in Salt Lake when they had that tornado about a decade ago, which was weird. Salt Lake doesn't get tornadoes, but we yeah. got one. And just and uh, cell service and internet were gone. I mean, it didn't. The wind blew, and that stuff was gone for hours and hours. And the only communication systems that were still up, battery powered stuff that the ham radio guys had. You know, they got it back up in six or seven hours. But during that period of time, ham community is vital. Uh, for yeah, even our new fire station over here, their emergency operations center is setting up for ham radios and got stations in it. And the mobile command centers yeah. all have ham radios. Yeah, we put a we put a, a, a dual band radio in the fire chief's mobile command post. Thanks to uh, Rich for donating the radio, the antenna, and so. Uh, 
now the fire chief has got, you know, communications. And we practice with our CERT teams, you know, we'll bring out the mobile command post, get in there, set up a net control and uh, send people out on doing search assignments. And we can relay information back and forth, take notes and provide an accurate uh, description of the incident to the, uh, the commander and the city's emergency manager as well. So we do all of this in real time, so. You skipped over the POTA. Oh, yes. Yeah, the POTA is, a, is a, another niche. It's parks on the hill. And Oak Butte is a designated park. And there are thousands and thousands of ham operators that collect parks and check them. So an activator goes into a national park or a state park and sets up a radio and says, I'm here. And people call in from all over the world. And you exchange signal reports. And then they rubber stamp, oh, I got both you, or I got Yellowstone, or I got, and then collect them. And it doesn't you can, involve climbing. And no, you don't have climb. you don't have to climb. And so I, I did both POTA and SOTA when I was on the top. Johnny and I have driven over just over into Gold View yeah, just once, and <laughs> set up radios and, and do POTA, and it's a lot of fun. People you know, come out of the woodwork when you say, I'm at a, a park, and this is my park number, it's Gold View. Boom. Comes oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. And there's a, a partial point is that then part of this is then you're practicing how to set up a radio under under your know, remote power. Um, yeah. So there's certain rules about POTA and SOTA. If POTA is a little more open SOTA, you actually cannot be hooked to, even if you could drive to the peak, you have to be completely disconnected from the your vehicle by a certain amount. You've got to be on on battery power, you can't be hooked to, you know, so, so, yeah, so that is to so practice many things. feet of the absolute top. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, within 80 feet of the designated yeah. point. And then POTA is a little more open, although I think even in POTA, you cannot be hooked to shore power. You've got to be on, on either vehicle or battery power, I think. Yeah. Isn't it something like that? You have to be within the boundaries of the park on your own steam. Yeah. You have a generator. You know. Generator or power and station or whatever you want. Yeah. Solar panels. So if you're solar out in the gold view, come back to your vehicle and the battery's gone. Some ham radio operators yeah. take that battery up to some point. <laughs> because they yeah, need to talk. Yeah. Um, so we can um, see if anybody online has some questions. Well, actually, they hear me, but I, I just pulled up. I don't think I see anything in the chat. But So if any of you that are listening online right now have any questions, feel free to type something in the chat and we can um, answer those. Um, one of you guys want to just turn on the radios in the back? We're going to fire that up. Show them that. If there's anything on, right how many now. people have we got on No, we have about seven. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Okay, Brenda just. So these little radios aren't affected too much by solar activity. They'll work almost, you know, 100% day or night, doesn't matter, uh, which is what you'd use for emergency use out in the monument. But some of the radios we have back here that are long distance, you don't need a repeater, you can bounce your signals off the ionosphere and go to the other side of the world. It is highly affected by solar activity, and I think everybody knows we've had a massive coronal mass ejection in our sun here recently that put aurora all over the, as far south as Phoenix that we're seeing the aurora. It also wiped out <laughs> that portion of the ham radio bands, and it'll take them a little while to recover. I got on just before it came down, and there was hardly any Activity. Yeah, it's still recovering from that blast of uh, radiation from the sun. And yeah, there is uh, atmosphere is up there, or we all fried. <laughs> right. And and that's actually one of the interests. So there's you know the the various frequencies that that are open to ham radio. Some of them like VHF, UHF, which is most of what the handhelds you see. They have um, you know nice direct line coverage, and then hook out to it. Most of the repeater systems are on on that for hookup. But then there's a, a you know uh, some of the lower frequencies and, and these things don't bounce off the ionosphere they kind of they're high frequency so they just shoot right on through stuff but the uh, lower frequencies will bounce off uh, stuff and so even you know fairly low wattage radios you know five ten watt radios can you know if the conditions are right you can talk to japan you know easy on a you know low power radio with with this stuff now you got to have some big wire antennas <laughs> you're dragging out you may only rerun at eight watts but but you got to have a decent antenna hook to it <laughs> yeah um, but but then we've also designed ways to have um, very portable antennas so that you can go up and string them up the, so if you see some guy though that's 
that's dragging a big long wire and, and shoving it up in the air, that's probably a ham operator running a, a low frequency radio to, to go out and, and do long communication. I don't want to see any questions from anyone online, but so you said like in um, HOAs, they don't allow the Some HOAs, not at all. Right, well, the ones that aren't cool. Um, yeah. They wouldn't allow an antenna. So are those antennas left up all the time? No, a lot of people will just, when it's, you know, if they want to operate, they uh, have it on like a little flagpole and they'll just raise it up yeah. and uh, they'll operate, uh, you know, sometimes they'll lay, do it later on at night or something or during the day. They just put it up, they use it, you know, portable and everything else, and then they'll take it back down. So it couldn't really be complained about. Right. And a lot of, uh, you know, some, a lot of people put antennas in their attic. I've got an antenna in my attic. Inside, uh, inside my oh. attic of my house, you know, and it works just fine. Oh. It would be probably work better outside a little bit, but not real. I don't know, you know. Uh, we can put it. We can put little antennas uh, in, in our driveway. We could, you know, portable masks and stuff like that, and and, and it all works. Uh, we I I put antennas, a wire antenna, a foot above the ground. You know, uh, in the backyard, just hanging, you know, hanging over the shrubs and everything else works like a champ, you know. So you don't you don't necessarily need a great big uh, tower or anything like that massive, like we always think about, you know, uh, but just a, a wire in your backyard and, you know, some kind of a, like an L configuration along the bushes, you know, just above the ground. Two, two feet, three feet above the ground works just fine. You know. When he says wire, it really is literally just a wire that then has just a little um, here uh, electronics hooked it right at the end of it to do old match but on it, just a little piece at the end of it, and then the rest of it's just a thin little wire that you just stretch out. Somewhere. So, so I don't, I don't know if this applies to ham radio, but so like Mitch's and my HOA it doesn't allow the same neighborhood. They say we're not allowed to have a TV antenna. Which is against federal law, right? Yeah, so, we'd have to challenge them, but that's tough to do. So I, so since we have a more restrictive thing, though, I, I, I'm, I'm slightly violating, but I put in a flag. Flagpoles are loud, so I've got a flagpole, and then on the top of the flagpole, I've got a small little antenna that blends in with the flagpole, and it, it's hardly visible that it's even there. So would your antenna have to be where, where there's air all around it, or could you put it up against a chimney or something like that? You can. You, yeah. you can't, yeah. it's not as effective against, right. the, you know, but if it's non-conductive material, then, you know, it, it's, it's not too bad. But uh, a, a lot of people, you know, disguise them inside of like, you know, flagpoles or something like that. Well, there's even some people that use their rain gutter as an antenna. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So well, I know the board members, so, so I don't well, TV antenna up really the where they can stick it. And then I do a, a, a wire a antenna wall. also like that, so I've got my flagpole, and I just take the flag down and hoist up. Right now, I've actually got a wire up, so I have a big wire that's stretched up temporarily, because it's not permanently, but then it, it's set up in a big V, so it's hooked off to the fence on one end, up to the top of the flagpole, and then to the fence on the other end. Just, yeah, and I can just hang it, pull it up there, and hook it up. Just tell us your clothesline to dry your clothes. Clothesline zero. I can see it, and I'm going to turn it in. Yeah, 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 you can see yeah. it. Yeah. I made the mistake of putting it on a orange cord to give it some strength, and I go, oh, now that orange cord is real visible, so I should have done it. So I, got a question, I got a question about your handheld. So I'm fairly new to the radios. And okay. For our uh, HOA it's at Sun, oh, at Sun City, our, our uh, Jeep Club, you have to have radios for that. So I bought a forty dollar radio, like you said. Is that the same radio that you guys have? It's just no. You probably frequency. have a GMRS radio. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's a GMRS. It, like a, it operates basically in the same frequencies. That yeah, the GMRS radios. frequency is just slightly higher. So you're like in a 462 megahertz range. Okay. We're down at 446 megahertz range on our on our UHF, our VHF. We're down 144 to 148 megahertz. Okay. So, so it's, it's a separate. Yeah, yeah it would be a separate radio, but you do know you have two repeaters available for your GMRS radio here in town. Okay. So you have one here and one on, in, Utah, and one on Utah Hill. And uh, so, are, what kind of radio is it? A GMRS UV nine R Pro or something <laughs> like that? Or I gave it to Glenn and he fixes it. <laughs> was, is it a Bofang or? Bofang, yeah. Exactly okay. Okay. That's a Bofang. So, is, is those Bofang radios? You know, uh, 
mine. I've got GMRS frequencies in mine. But yeah. Well, this this so little thing, some can go all is a a watt radio, and I have programmed in both the GMRS and the ham radio frequencies, as both, as both it, which technically is illegal to do because you can't have a radio that does both. But I'm licensed with both. And, so so sometimes our technicalities, you yeah, know, technicalities we, we, it's, 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 it's a guideline, you know, it's more of a guideline, right? Uh, and, and then my wife, who doesn't have a ham license, yeah. her radio is the, the, the yeah. Fofang 9R Pro, just, which is all GMRS. Okay. And so but I can call her and talk to her on this. Yes. Yes. So, so, that's why some, so I have these nice Bofang GMRSs, and, right. and they're... They're basically worthless to talk to Mitch or my other neighbor who has ham radio in his Jeep. Well, now in my Jeep, I've got the GMRS programmed in it. I've done the same thing even yeah. in my bigger radio, so I can yeah. go over to the GMRS. My mobile that's in the vehicle is both GMRS and Anthem. It's a, just a small modification of the ham radio that opens the frequencies up so it will receive the GMRS. And you can find Most somebody dealers. that's a scoff law. I personally <laughs> am pure. I have not done it. <laughs> I have no problem with scoff laws. Most of us will actually buy the GMRS license, so we're no, close two, to nine, we're sort of. One, yeah. five, I've got the license. One. I'm just afraid to open that radio up and start cutting diodes. <laughs> so are you going to do the tour? Oh. Yeah, we could, uh, let me, yes, we probably should start that then, uh, if we're getting close, we're already at 7 o'clock. So I am going to defend, in late 70s, early 80s, you had to have a license for CB. And, and I have a call number, and you had to log in and log off every time you got on. And we did have standards back then. I will say, since they have a license. Uh, Bullshit! <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> turn it on. Most older hams like us started with C. Yeah. You know, and said, hey, I like this stuff. And back in the day, I really enjoyed doing it. But uh, I, I think we all, we all did it. We all cut our teeth on CBs and stuff like that. But you found that, you know, unless you were going down a flat interstate, you couldn't get much more than a couple of miles a lot of times. I talked. I was talking one night to a guy. I was in San Jose, California. And I'm talking to this guy. I go, where are you anyway? And he goes, uh, I'm in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Oh, I guess we better stop talking. <laughs> no, we skip. Uh, you know that 11 meter band. Back then, when the solar cycle was open, uh, I have a friend. We have a friend, mutual friend, that Rick Locker. You guys know. He was in California. Talked to a a, a radio operator in Japan. So this is a weekly net that we're doing with our Las Vegas Repeater Association. So it's starting now, and so we as hammer radio operators are going to ch check in. But I could, I, I could so check in with the radio so or use. So this here is our emergency operations center from this key, our temporary one. When the new fire station gets built, we're putting radios in there and everything else. We also have GMRS mobile radio in there for our circuit. So do you have a key to get in if there's an emergency? Yes. Yeah. That's how we got in tonight. Yeah. Now, these but then there's people who are doing the day. Yeah. And this is dual use. It's both for the students at the STEM Center to come and learn about this stuff. But it's also functions as a backup emergency center. I think I'm going to go ahead and, and um, stop our recording and now and because we kind of see yeah. unless there's anything else, Johnny, you want to? Uh, I don't have anything else, but anybody that's interested in you know, joining our club, wanting to get a hand radio license, you know, get a, get a hold of Mitch or get a hold of me, I give him my contact information and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get you all set up. Yeah. And you got you run classes on a regular basis to well, I run days. classes as, as needed, you know, so we, we've had we've run probably five classes so far this year and uh we haven't had any failures everybody's passed so. for the for the tech the tech it doesn't doesn't take very long to go so anyhow thanks for joining us this evening i'm going to end the recording and we will see you at our next speaker series